everybody, and uh, welcome to the Bass Lecture Hall here at the uh, University of Texas. Um, I'm Will and Bowden, and it's uh, my pleasure to be introducing our, our distinguished guest speaker today. Uh, we have multiple sponsorships for this event, and I want to make sure each has to get to do. There's the um, Alexander Hamilton Society, the uh, University of Texas chapter, that's a student organization uh, dedicated to promoting constructive debates and uh, thoughtful exchange of ideas uh, based on American principles and foreign policy. There's the Cummings Center for History, Strategy, and Statecraft, uh, which I am the executive director, and we are dedicated to history, strategy, and statecraft. So we <laughs> <laughs> our entire head there. And then there's the Strauss Center for International Security and Law. Um, and I know many of you are very familiar with that Strauss Center as well. So I think it's a, a nice illustration of the um, many dynamic activities going on here at, at UT and at LBK, especially related to foreign policy. We've got three different organizations who are able to come together and uh, sponsor a talk. So uh, our speaker today is a, a longtime friend and colleague of mine, uh, so there's a, a personal as well as a professional pleasure to be able to introduce him. Um, Elliot Abrams, who is still young, dynamic, and spry, I need to uh, offer that uh, caveat front, has really lived a, a life that has spanned uh, almost a half century of American foreign policy. Um, he started when he was one year old, so. Uh, <laughs> Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be back here on the campus again and to talk a little bit about the book and the, uh, the subject matter of the book, uh, which is the Bush administration and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Not, uh, you know, the Lebanon conflict, not Iran, not Iraq, but that particular um, issue, which I think is interesting enough to, uh, and, and had enough good stories to warrant <coughs> writing a book about it. Um, and the book, the book is really a memoir, and it is chronological. And it starts, as it should, on the first day, which is January 20th, 2001, um, when normally when one president hands over to another, the two presidents uh, meet in the Oval Office, and they, uh, they chit-chat for a few minutes before they go on up to the Capitol for the actual inauguration. There's no substance to it. But there was, on January 20th, 2001, when Clinton handed over to George W. Bush, because Clinton had something he wanted to say. Camp David had just collapsed. And what Clinton wanted to say was, don't you ever trust that son of a bitch, Arafat. He lied to me. Arafat will lie to you. Don't trust him. You can't work with him. You can't negotiate with him. Um, and it was repeated, not once, but two, three, four times. Um, a really strong message that Clinton delivered. Um, I tell you that partly because it's the way the book begins, but partly because it's a reminder of where things stood on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in 2001. I have heard the complaint or criticism of the Bush administration that um, you guys, you know, you got interested in negotiating peace in the Middle East in 2007 or 2008. It was just like Clinton. It was too late. You did it at the end. That is an ahistorical judgment. When you think back to 2001, what was going on in 2001, Camp David had just collapsed, and now there was the Second Intifada. What there was was a tremendous amount of violence. In 2001 and 2002, 
cafes and buses were being blown up uh, in Jerusalem constantly. And the Israeli reaction, in the West Bank particularly, was very strong. And the goal of the Bush administration of those early days was one that was a consensus goal of the whole administration, stop the violence. That was the task in, in front of us, not returning to Camp David. Nobody even thought about that. It was an inconceivable thought. The job was to get the, uh, the violence down. Some people didn't think Bush did a good enough job at that, and among them, by the way, were the Saudis. And there was an interesting interlude in the summer of 2001. There's a letter from the Saudis to the president saying, basically, you don't care about Palestinian life. You don't care how many Palestinians the Israelis kill. And we can't have the kind of relationship that we've had. This is from the Crown Prince. You know, since my father, the founder, King Abdulaziz, met with Franklin Roosevelt, we can't continue that kind of relationship if you show callous indifference to Palestinians. Um, what that led to was a decision that the president would endorse Palestinian statehood. And there are two interesting aspects to that. First, uh, that's a big deal. When I worked in the Reagan administration for George Shultz, we were against Palestinian statehood. We were not for a Palestinian state. Gaza goes back to Egypt. West Bank goes back to Jordan. We weren't for a Palestinian state. So now the president was going to come out formally to endorse a Palestinian state. He was um, basically misled on this by the Department of State. Because the White House asked, you know, isn't this, this is a very big deal, isn't it? This is a huge policy in innovation. And they said, nah, not really. That's important, not because it shouldn't have been done, but because maybe we could have gotten something from the Saudis in exchange for it. Maybe we could have gone to them and said, the president's willing, willing to make this huge leap in American policy but we'd like you to do the following four things. We got nothing for doing this. The other interesting aspect of this, by the way, was we then thought, where can the president make this announcement? This is a big deal. What's the best place, best venue? United Nations, his first speech to the UN General Assembly uh, in September. And so these lines about a Palestinian state were put into his speech, which was to have been delivered on September 12th. Of course, then came 9-11, and that session of the UN did not take place. It was postponed a couple of months. Um, after 9-11, the president tried to figure out what happened here. Why did this happen? Why did nine Saudis come and kill 3,000 Americans? And there was a kind of ready-made answer from the State Department, actually, which was Israel. Why did they hate us? They hate us because we're too pro-Israel. The president rejected that view. He thought about it and noted what I think is true, which is if you go back to what Osama bin Laden was saying in those days, he wasn't talking about Palestine and Israel. He was talking about Mecca. He was talking about Riyadh. His real complaint was with the Saudi government, his government. Um, Bush came around to the view that we were for a Palestinian state, but, but the problem in the Middle East was the lack of political opportunity, democracy, the lack of open society, the lack of social mobility, the lack of economic opportunity. These were closed societies. That's what produced this bitterness. And one of the new open democratic societies we wanted there to be was Palestine. Um, that led him to a conclusion, which was, Arafat's got to go. Because one thing we're sure, you're not going to get a democratic, modern, progressive Palestine with a corrupt terrorist as its leader. So uh, in fact, in April and June 2002, he gave two important speeches in which he said, Arafat's got to go. <coughs> Seen from 2013, that may not appear to be a huge policy innovation. But I remind you, the foreign leader who visited the White House most frequently in the Clinton years was not Tony Blair, it was Yasser Arafat. 13 visits. So to now say, Arafat's got to go. There'll be no Palestinian state with Arafat. They need new leadership. 
that is not terrorist, that is not corrupt, that is democratic. Um, not only was that new, but it was highly unpopular. Bush went from that June speech to a G8 meeting in, in which he was, as he said, the skunk at the garden party because everyone thought he is dooming the chances for, uh, for peace. Um, having given the speech, we then proceeded to try to figure out, you know, a speech is one thing, a policy is another. How do you do this? You want a Palestinian state. You want a peaceful, democratic Palestinian state. Living at peace with Israel and so forth. That's nice. How do you get there? So the roadmap was developed. The roadmap for peace in the Middle East, which, which was developed mostly by the State Department and was, by the way, in part, an effort by the State Department to pull back control of Middle East policy from the White House. Those two speeches in April and June were White House speeches. Um, it, Secretary Powell had said in April and May and June, the President needs to give a speech outlining his Middle East policy. When the speech draft was done, uh, Powell hated it. The State Department hated it. They did not want him to dismiss Arafat in that way. Um, they, with the Europeans, uh, largely, and the Jordanians, wrote this roadmap for peace in the Middle East. Um, and we thought, in 2002, okay, we're moving here. 2001, get the violence down. Also 2002, try to get the violence down, but let's move forward. You have the president making these speeches about how we move forward to peace in the Middle East, to a democratic Palestine. Now you have the roadmap. Um, we're getting into 2003 now. Now you have the roadmap, which the Israelis and Palestinians essentially agree upon. We have a way forward. And part of that roadmap was, let's put some meat on the bones of pushing Arafat aside. Let's get him to create the job of prime minister. He was president and to give some duties to the prime ministership. Uh, he was finally forced by the Americans, the Europeans, and the Arab donors to create the job and fill it with Mahmoud Abbas, his successor, um, in April 2003. That, we thought, this is real progress. So in June 2003, we have what we call the Red Sea Summits, Sharm el-Sheikh and Aqaba. The, um, the president meets in Sharm el-Sheikh with Mubarak, uh, Crown Prince of uh, Saudi Arabia, King of Bahrain, King of Jordan, and uh, Abbas, the new prime minister. Then goes to Aqaba where Sharon, Abbas, and Bush meet. Um, I have to tell you, um, the, the Sharm el-Sheikh summit was really beyond belief. It was at the uh, Movenpick Hotel, which was beloved of Hosni Mubarak. It's where he had all these meetings. He spent a lot of time in Sharm el-Sheikh. The meeting almost never took, almost did not take place because the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia wouldn't come out of his room. Quite bizarre. I mean, all these other heads of government are sitting around waiting for him to show up. We have this beautiful conference table set up. Somebody had told him that we, the Americans, had sneaked in Ariel Sharon. And he would have to meet with Sharon if he came to the meeting, which was Ludicrous, nonsense. He wouldn't come out of his room. By the time he was finally persuaded to come out of his room, the time for the conference was over. So there was no meeting. There was a press availability. Um, literally, the, the, you know, there was like an hour and a half ready, put aside for the meeting. He comes out after an hour and a half. We have to go. The press is waiting. Uh, this will, the next story is kind of your tax dollars at work. If you look at the Sharm el-Sheikh summit, it's probably on YouTube, I mean that moment when they, I think it was Mubarak who read the statement for these other leaders, and they're behind him. Now it's about 110 degrees. The location is right, is, is there in Sharm el-Sheikh on the Strait of Tehran with Tehran Island behind. It's glorious, it's gorgeous, but it's 110. How are you gonna put these guys in 110? If you look at the, the photos or the videos, you will notice that none of them are sweating. And the reason for that is the Corps of Engineers, uh, on the edge of this cliff overlooking the water and, the, and Tehran Island, we had built a platform for them to stand on. And at the bottom of the cliff had brought a bunch of giant air conditioning condensers. And cold air was piped up in huge tubes under the stage 
So if you were on the stage, it was, you know, 65, 70 degrees. And if you were 10 feet to the side, it was 110 degrees. As I say, your tax dollars at work. We thought after that summit, we're really moving here. You know, we'd had the Arab leaders meet. We'd had Sharon and Abbas meet. Both of them gave terrific speeches. We are moving toward this goal of a peace agreement and uh, a Palestinian state. June. By the end of the summer 2003, gone. Because Arafat forced Abbas out. Arafat didn't like it. Arafat was jealous. After the June summit, we had Abbas come to the White House, you know, Rose Garden, White House lawn, um, the whole TV thing that Arafat used to do. Arafat was not pleased. And by the end of the summer, Abbas had been so squeezed out that he resigned. So we were basically summer of two, end of the summer 2003, all of our plans for moving forward, all of our feeling, we've got this, you know, we're in good shape here, gone. We were kind of lost, trying to figure out what's next. And I was sent to see Prime Minister Sharon. He was making an official visit to Italy. Um, <clears throat> so I went over to Rome and saw him. The most memorable story about that trip is um, I thought, you know, he's got the presidential suite at the Rome Hilton. This is going to be one of the great Italian meals I'm ever going to have, right? They're going to give him the best Italian food they can. And he was a good eater. He would appreciate it. Um, so we go to his suite. And we sit down in the dining room. And in comes some Mossad guy holding a tray of cold cuts, just slabs of meat. That was my great meal. And the, the, so they put it down on the table. And Sharon starts to cut meat and eat. Sharon always ate first. Talk comes later. First comes the food, as you could see from his figure then. Um, <laughs> And the meat that he's cutting is the piece of meat closest to him, which is a nice, round, pink piece of meat. And we're in Italy. And I thought, you know, this has got to be ham, right? And I'm wondering, you know, does he really eat ham? Uh, so I said to him, Prime Minister, that meat you're cutting, what kind of meat do you think that is? To which he replied, as he was chewing, and cutting. Elliot, sometimes it is better not to ask. <laughs> and he continued on with his meal. Um, it was at that meeting that he told me I've decided to get out of Gaza. He too saw that we were dead in the water. He thought that was bad for him, for Israel. Because uh, he actually told Bush later, um, he thought, you know, if everything's dead in the water, if there's a vacuum, a lot of bad ideas are going to appear. And in his view, we're already appearing. So, he decided to get out of Gaza, something that I think he decided essentially as a general. As a military proposition, 7,000 Jews in the middle of a million and a half Arabs wasn't going to work. Huge strain on his army to protect them. We spent most of 2004 and 2005 simply politically, I mean, backing him, trying to get him through what was a huge political battle in Israel. Ultimately, you know, he broke up his party over this Likud party and created his own party, Kadima, in order to get this through. In April 2004, the president uh, wrote him a letter and gave a speech. Sharon was in Washington, which was a kind of political reward to Sharon in an effort to help him win the battle because he kept losing. There would be a cabinet vote that he wouldn't win, or there would be a Likud Central Committee vote that he wouldn't win. So we thought he really deserved and needed this political boost from the President of the United States. Um, that was 2004, 2005, and it got us to the departure from Gaza. Now, meanwhile, I should just say, uh, November 2004, Arafat dies. So the question of his leadership is no longer important. Um, for moving forward, Mahmoud Abbas is elected President in January 2005, summer of 2005, um, Sharon does in fact pull out of Gaza. And once again, we thought, we're back on track. Sharon did this, and we believed that he had the similar thing in mind for the West Bank. Uh, there was a lot of fear on the part of Palestinians that you know, he was pulling out of Gaza so that he never had to do anything in the West Bank. Now, I can't prove to you 
Uh, there's no way what he intended to do. I have talked to just about every key collaborator he has and asked them, what do you think? And their answer is yes. He planned to pull back in the West Bank, at least to the security barrier that he was building, uh, by then really was finished, um, to create a, an interim border for Israel, something that could last until such time as there was a final agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. We'll never know, of course, uh, what he intended. Because from our point of view, Gaza is done. It's successful. That's late August 2005. Now we move forward with Sharon, and then he has his strokes. At the end of 2005, and then the second stroke, January 2006, which puts him in the coma that he remains in today. So we thought once again, OK, best laid plans. We are really moving forward here. Undone. Um, but turned out that was too pessimistic, because his successor comes forward, Ehud Olmert, who had been deputy prime minister. Um, and Olmert wants to pull back in the West Bank, and he runs on it. That's his platform in the election he then calls uh, in early um, 2006. Uh, he holds an election, and he runs on the idea of pulling back in the West Bank. Two things happened, though, in 2006 that made that impossible and ultimately, I think, defeated that possibility for the rest of the Bush administration. One of them was something that happened in early 2006, which is the Palestinians held a parliamentary election and Hamas won. Um, we had enormously detailed debates about whether Hamas should be permitted to run in that election. Um, I could do a good two-hour discussion of this, but I think after the first hour, I'd lose a few of you. Um, let me just say, the Palestinians said Hamas has to be able to run because they are the key opposition to the Fatah party, which was in power. If the purpose of the parliamentary election was to move toward a more democratic political system, and to legitimize the Palestinian government in the West Bank, and at that point still in Gaza, if you exclude the only real competition, Hamas, what kind of an election is that? It's a phony election. It's the kind of phony election that we were then seeing in Tunisia and Egypt and Syria. It doesn't legitimize, it delegitimizes. So said President Abbas and his uh, advisors. Meanwhile, the Israelis were saying they're terrorists, you can't let them run. And that view, by the way, was not just Sharon's, it was the Israeli left. The peace people in Israel, the peace movement, people like Yossi Balin, who had been Minister of Justice and one of the most um, active promoters of peace with the Palestinians said, hey, Oslo prevents this. Oslo says clearly terrorist groups can't run in elections until they lay down their arms. We were also hearing this from Democrats, small d and large d, in the United States. Terrorist groups can't be allowed to run, and it isn't just a matter of Palestine. What about Kosovo? There'll be plenty of other places where there are armed groups. They cannot be allowed to run in an election until they lay down their arms. Um, how did we deal with these two arguments, pro and con? Um, compromise. A compromise that the quartet uh, the group that had been created to handle Middle Eastern democracy, U.S., Russia, EU, and U.N. Secretary General. In September, the quartet issued a statement that basically said, uh, you know, democracy, democratization doesn't happen in an hour and a half. It's a process. Armed groups can participate in the beginning of the process, the election, but they can't participate in the government until they lay down their arms. We did not think that this would be such a terrible problem in the 2000, January 2006 parliamentary election because nobody expected Hamas to win. Nobody expected Hamas to win in September and October and November. Yeah, they were going up. You know, they were going to get 20%. They were going to get 30%. They were going to get 33%. That's fine. And the Fatah people said, that's fine. Let them participate. And actually, 
a decent showing will encourage more of them to turn to politics instead of terrorism, violence. Um, they won, as I recall, at 44-41 in the popular vote, so it was a close election. But they did win. And that uh, meant that our relations with the Palestinians became instantly much more difficult because they had a parliamentary system here now under the control of a terrorist group which ran the parliament. It was illegal under American law to support a terrorist group. You couldn't give them aid. Not only you couldn't give them official aid through AID, um, and if you were, a, if you were a, um, an NGO now working with the uh, pieces of the, par of the Palestinian government, you could be violating American criminal counterterrorism laws. Um, that was the first thing that happened in 2006 that crashed the peace process. The second was the war in Lebanon. Because Olmert said, uh, look, I will pull back in the West Bank. President Bush said to him, don't do it unilaterally unless that's the only alternative. Try negotiating. Um, after the war in Lebanon, and, and uh, the war in Lebanon was a war of choice for Israel. You remember the Hezbollah had come across the border and had killed and captured several Israeli soldiers. There were a number of ways Israel might have responded. Um, I've had a number of Israeli generals say to me, the right response would have been to bomb Hezbollah sites for several days, but not have a war. But Omer chose to have a war, and then the war didn't go well. He lost political credibility, and he never got it back. That was the summer of 2006. He was prime minister for another two and a half years, till early 2009. But his ability to do what he said he would do on the peace process in the West Bank uh, was gone. Now, I tell you that in part because, again, I'm getting back to this argument. You know, the Bush administration wasn't interested in peace, didn't try to get peace. We tried and tried for eight years. I would argue that after the summer of 2006, it was really impossible on the Israeli side. I also thought it was impossible on the Palestinian side, particularly after the Hamas victory in the election. I did not think that President Abbas was in a position to sign a comprehensive peace agreement. Now, some people disagreed. Some people of a certain degree of consequence disagreed, like Secretary of State Rice and Prime Minister Olmert. And thus we had the Annapolis process. Um, after the Lebanon war, I think that Secretary Rice largely lost confidence in the Israelis' management of their own affairs, uh, diplomatic affairs, political affairs, even military affairs, and said you know, she would take this in her own hands and try to get done whatever could be done um, and start this negotiation uh, that led in the summer of 2007 to the announcement of the Annapolis meeting, which was then held around Thanksgiving 2007, which gave us a year. Uh, very much what happened in the Clinton administration, you know, the last years dedicated to this negotiation. Um, and just as Camp David failed, so did Annapolis. Olmert made what I think was a very generous offer, and Abbas did not accept it. Why not? Well, I, you know, one reason is, look, uh, Olmert was on his way out. You can make that argument. In fact, some Israelis made that argument to uh, Abbas. Don't sign with him. He's leaving. What's the point of signing an agreement with a prime minister who won't be prime minister in a month? Wait for the new prime minister. Um, I think that's part of it, but I think there's something deeper. I asked, and uh, the guy who had been uh, U.S. Consul General in Jerusalem, who's kind of the ambassador to the Palestinians, for five years, He'd been there. Why do you think Abbas didn't sign? And his answer was, he's never going to sign anything. He's not, um, you know, a heroic, charismatic leader. He doesn't have the legitimacy of Arafat. He was elected president in 2005 for a four-year term. Guess what? It's 2013 now. So his term is up. They, don't, they have not had new elections. Um, so the Consul General said, I never thought he was going to sign anything, and I still don't. And I have to say, that's the view I came to. You know, Hamas is there looking over his shoulder. Anything he signed 
would immediately be called treason, right? Arafat didn't do this. Arafat didn't give away that. Arafat didn't betray the, uh, the refugees. You did. You sold out to the Americans, the West, the Israelis, whatever. I didn't think he was going to sign that. And unfortunately, that uh, proved to be true. Um, I should bring this to a close in a few minutes so we have more time for questions. Uh, how did it, let me turn to the question before I stop then of what do we learn from all this? The successes, the failures, <clears throat> ultimately the failure to get a, a peace agreement. We learn, we learn a few things, I think. Um, one of the things we learned, which I think was true in the Bush years and is more evident today, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not the center of life in the Middle East. Now, we could have argued about that, I think, more evenly in 2005 or 6 or 7. But look around now. Suppose we could get an Israeli-Palestinian deal tomorrow morning. Good deal. Do you think that the Syrians would stop killing each other? Do you think that Iran would stop trying to build a nuclear weapon? Do you think that Egypt would suddenly become stable? Uh, it is clearly not the central event in the Middle East. Um, and I have to admit to a certain degree of incomprehension of why Secretary of State Kerry wants to spend as much time on it as he seems to want to spend, given the rest of the world and even the rest of the, um, of the Middle East. Um, I think one of the other things we learned is the mistake of concentrating on negotiations as opposed to state building bottom up. Tony Blair once said, uh, I interviewed him for the book, um, what's happening on the ground is going to dictate the diplomacy. The diplomacy is not going to dictate what happens on the ground. Um, you know, look at, look, at the, uh, look at it this way. If you try for a comprehensive agreement, Camp David, Annapolis, and you don't get the comprehensive agreement, what have you got? You have nothing. In the case of Camp David, you may have less than nothing. You may have an intifada. Suppose that you concentrate instead on um, trying to remove 100 Israeli roadblocks and barriers to mobility in the West Bank. Well, you don't get all the way there. You only remove 50. That's very good if you could remove 50. And in fact, some have been removed. Suppose you concentrated on the ability of West Bank Palestinians to work in Israel. So it's terrific for the economy. Maybe you don't get as many of them able to work there. You get half as many as you want. Progress. I could give other examples, but what I'm suggesting is we concentrated, we gave priority to the wrong thing. I remember in 2007, 2008, as we're concentrating on this diplomacy, comprehensive, comprehensive deal, Prime Minister Fayyad, who's now about to resign, Fayyad saying, you know, you're not helping me. I am trying to build a Palestinian state bottom up, ministry by ministry. Police, hospitals, schools, courts, finance ministry, health ministry. You're not helping me. You know, when you, when you uh, do these negotiations and you try to get some concessions from the Israelis and you, so you get some prisoners out, how does that help build a state? I think that's right, and I think that if the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations over the past, you know, let's say 20 years, had prioritized state building, we would be a lot closer to having a viable Palestinian state than we are today. I think that's another thing we, we learn. One other thing I think is that um, you hear a lot it's ridiculous that we can't solve this because, you know, they're an inch apart. They're an inch apart. I mean, come on. They've been negotiating forever. Everybody knows what a peace agreement's going to look like. Just push them over the line. I think we've learned from the Clinton years and Bush years, certainly, that is not right. Everybody does not know what an agreement is going to look like, and they're not an inch away from one. Take, just take one issue, Jerusalem. There is no agreement between Israelis and Palestinians on Jerusalem. They're not an inch away from coming to an agreement on Jerusalem. Uh, again, I, I, I will confess to being unable to explain why Secretary Kerry thinks they're able to come to an agreement now. 
Um, unfortunately, I don't think so. I don't think they're, um, they're that close. Um, I, I would say one other, one other thing, which we learned from the Clinton and Bush and Obama years, and, and I'll stop with that. Uh, Clinton and Bush had the view or tactic of hugging the Israelis. No daylight, no visible daylight between the U.S. and Israeli position. The theory was, if you're hugging them, you have a better opportunity to squeeze and get what you want. And they'll feel more secure and they're more likely to give you what you want. Um, the President Obama had a different theory, which was we were too close and we needed to create some daylight and that that would give us a better opportunity. I think the last four years have proved that that is wrong, that Clinton and Bush had it right. And <clears throat> my proof of this is I think President Obama has abandoned that view as something that he was advised to do four years ago um, and has now concluded it was bad advice. Uh, thus, his trip to Israel and the, the uh, positions he took during that trip, uh, both the specific policy positions but also the kind of embrace of Israel. Um, I think that's the right conclusion and I think he's going to get more out of this situation if he continues with that policy than one of, of, of creating visible daylight between the U.S. and Israel, distancing us from them. Um, in, I hope in the Q&A period uh, we can cover a lot of stuff that I did not cover and um, there are lots more stories, some of which I'm sure will be elicited by your questions and comments. So let me just turn it over to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you to Will and for inviting me. And uh, let's hear from you. I, I, I should um, go back to Ariel Sharon when he said, sometimes it is better not to ask. Right now it's better to ask, so go ahead. Okay, Yes. Hi, my name is Luis Silva. I'm the student here at the LCS Law School. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the story. There was a story back in 2008 that the Bush administration had supported um, Fatah in a class pushing out of uh, Hamas in Gaza through, uh, I think his name is Mohammed Dahan. Mm -hmm. Uh, what what the Hamas takeover did? So I mean, or, the ah, right. Well, that's an easy one to comment on. It, it, it's just not so. Uh, it, you're right that the story is out there. I mean, uh, you can you know if you try to Google it, you'll find a lot of references to it. That what we had in mind was some kind of um, crushing of Hamas in Gaza. Um, it's just not so. Nor could Dachlan have done it, frankly. Um, I mean, Dachlan, da, Mohammed Dachlan was the, uh, was the sort of, I don't know what you'd call him, the top military or security guy for the Palestinian Authority, which is to say for the Fatah party, really. Um, and, uh, you know, in the end, proved to be completely incompetent. Um, he had, he told us, something like 10,000, 20,000 men under arms in Gaza. Um, and it turned out that you know, most of that was padding the payroll to steal money. Uh, and the ones that were actually on the payroll wouldn't fight, most of them. Uh, whereas the Hamas people of whom, I think there were really only about 1,000, would fight and fought and won uh, in a very quick battle in June 2007. Um, what I can't tell you, what I cannot tell you is whether people in Hamas actually believed that Dachlan was about to do, or with American support, was about to do some kind of crushing coup. I don't know. Um, you know, they have said so, but that doesn't mean it's true. And the question really is, were they, did they know how incompetent the Fatah people were? Did they know they had nothing to be afraid of, actually? Um, I don't really know the answer to that. I only know that we never contemplated such a thing and we never did such a thing. Uh, I can't really explain why the Hamas coup happened when it happened. That is a reasonable explanation. 
That is, that they genuinely thought, we better move now because in a month we won't be able to move. Um, but in a month they would have been able to move because nothing was going to happen. Yes? <laughs> it's about the lead up to the Lebanon war in 2006, when that is one of the things that unhinged the progressive moment. Um, and one of the things that started that, there was kind of a, a norm on how you would treat people on the border, who would cross the border, what would happen with patrols. And for some reason, both Hamas and Hezbollah, in sequence at that time, changed their behavior that led up to this. They killed people and grabbed people that they would not have done previously. And that seems very consequential. And I'm kind of wondering what your explanation for that change in behavior, which I don't think they intended to unhinge the peace process through it, but what were they intending uh, that led to this big escalation? The second thing is uh, now, um, I agree with you again, you suggested that there's not much near term hope for a deal that uh, pursuing less diplomacy than what it's got there is thinking. Um, but then you criticize the Obama administration for their previous policy of distance from the Israeli side. Um, if neither the hub works nor the distance works, why doesn't distance seem like a better policy? Because then at least they have to deal with the consequences of their continued. It's not us. It's not us continuing to encourage the, the uh, dispute. They just have to make their own choices. Well, they have to make their own choices anyway. It. It. it I, my answer to that would be. Um, I think that the Bush and Clinton administrations had more influence with both the Israelis and the Palestinians simultaneously because we were hugging, we were closer. Um, the, on the Palestinian side, it's because they thought we can deliver the Israelis on some things. So I don't think you gain anything from the distancing. And of course, the distancing doesn't just affect the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Uh, we have a lot of other issues to take up with the Israelis, Syria, Egypt, uh, Iran. Um, and none of that is helped by creating a, a feeling of insecurity on, on their part. So I just don't think you gain anything. I think you gain a lot more with the Israelis and Palestinians. And, and by the way, the, the Arabs. I mean, we were also closer to the Gulf Arabs, I think, than the, this administration is. So I just I don't think you you gain in any context um, by that distancing. Uh, what you end up having, and by the way, you, you end up having more people seeing that, end up having more anti-Israel activity in the UN, which you then end up fighting and vetoing. So you don't benefit from that either. Um, to the first part of the question, I'm, of course, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're analyzing, we're guessing. Part of it may be the disappearance of Sharon. Uh, Sharon, you know, reputation as a very tough military leader. Now comes Ehud Olmert, who's a pal, who, was, who never had any military service, who had been mayor of Jerusalem. And so let's test. Let's see. Israel, you know, new government, new leader, just had an election. Let's see how they react to this. And um, Sheikh Nasrallah of Hezbollah, you know, famously said, I didn't think they were going to do this, and had I known, I, you know, I probably wouldn't have gone across the border that way. With Hamas, um, it's strange to me. You know, they, the, when the Israelis pulled out of Gaza, summer 2005, they said, now there's no excuse whatsoever for any terrorist activity out of Gaza, and if there is any, bam, we're going to strike. But they didn't. Sharon was still prime minister, September, October, November, December, and there were some rockets out of Gaza. And he didn't use you know, tremendous amounts of force. I don't know why. Uh, I would have expected a tougher reaction. Um, but that may have been a big mistake in that it may have taught Hamas a bad lesson, which was you can get away with this stuff. And there was a lot of it. In the course of 2007 and 2008, virtually, Every meeting we had with the Israelis, with particularly Defense Minister Barak, um, he would say, in the end, you know, we can't tolerate this. If Hamas keeps up this steady flow of rockets, we're going to go into Gaza. 
it's not a threat, and we're not telling you, you know, it's around the corner, but <laughs> at some point, it's going to happen. Of course, it happened in December 2008. And again, what's so bizarre about it is, if you look at 2008, uh, August, September, October, the number of rockets rises pretty substantially. What did they think was going to happen? Did they really think that, I don't know, maybe, you know, Olmert's on his last legs, Israel's going to have an election, he's on the way out, they're confused, they won't act? If so, it was, of course, a grave misjudgment. But that's the only theory I, I can come up with, that they thought that politics in Israel was such, leadership changes, that Israel would postpone and postpone and postpone acting. Yes, sir. I'll come to you next one. Given the decades of failure of negotiations in the so-called peace process, is it not time to have another look at the three-state solution, Jordan, Israel, and Egypt? Well, uh, you know, there are two alternatives in a sense. There's a one-state solution, a three-state solution. Um, I still think that the two-state solution is the best solution um, for Palestinians and for Israelis, partly because there is no desire, for example, on the part of Egypt to take back Gaza. Uh, they have fairly difficult relations with Muslim Brotherhood-run Gaza. Um, on the West Bank, I, I end the book by asking, what about Jordan here? Uh, suppose you had a Palestinian state. Suppose we create one tomorrow. It's not going to be much of a bargain. You know, it's small. It's poor. It's landlocked. It has no natural resources. That state is almost certainly going to get instantly into some kind of economic union with Jordan. They probably use the Jordanian currency. They'll be flying out of Amman International Airport. They'll probably have a free trade agreement instantly. So you'll have, I, I would think, an almost complete economic union, which raises the question in my mind of, well, what about the political side? Uh, people have talked about, you know, a kind of Habsburg thing. You have one king and two prime ministers, two electoral systems, two parliaments. Um, the thing is that, that Gaza is not integrated with the West Bank the way the West Bank is logically integrated with Jordan, it seems to me. I don't think anymore it will be integrated with Israel. There was a time when people thought that would happen, and I think the two intifadas have put paid to that. I don't think it will be possible. A, a friend of mine, colleague, uh, was in Jerusalem recently and took a cab to Ramallah, and when you do that, you, you use it, um, Arab, Jerusalem Arab cab driver um, who knows both Jerusalem and the West Bank. And so they got to chatting. And my friend said to the cab driver, who was, lived in Jerusalem his whole life, uh, was an Arab, spoke perfect Hebrew. Um, my friend said, what, what, do you, what do you want to see at the end here? What's really the, the outcome you'd like to see? And the guy said, an interesting answer, the guy said, 1967, and he then explained what he meant. In the immediate aftermath of the 67 war, the border was completely open. Uh, West Bank Palestinians went to the beach in Tel Aviv. Israelis shopped in the West Bank. Things were a little bit cheaper. Palestinians in the West Bank, 100, I think it was 500,000 at the, at the top, worked in Israel. And he said, that was great. I'd like to go back to that. Well. That's what I'm saying, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Uh, Israelis at this point don't want that kind of integration. Uh, they want that barrier and they want Palestinians looking east. So I think the question of Jordan is, at least in my mind, it's, a, it's an open question. Gaza is a much tougher one. Will.
second more particular one. Um, a University of Texas alum, Salon Faya, has been reviewed <coughs> Well, the first part, the Arab Spring, I think it's, it's uh, very bad for the prospects for peace because, you know, uh, the Israelis and Palestinians don't have enough to offer each other. For them to, to sign a peace agreement requires huge, difficult compromises in both political systems. Very tough. One of the reasons why they haven't done it yet. Um, so they both need support from that outer ring of Arab states. The Palestinians need cover. There, whatever is signed, whether you or I think it's a good deal, they're going to be told you're traitors, you're, uh, it's treason, you've given everything away. They need to have the Arab states say, no, it is not. This is a good deal. You were right to sign this deal. We're with you 100%. The chances of that happening today are diminished. You know, the last time there was an Arab peace plan was 2002, and the main people behind it were the Saudi leaders, then Crown Prince, now King, Abdullah and Mubarak. Mubarak's gone from power. Abdullah is, I think, 94 and in poor health. And the Saudi, in fact, the whole Saudi leadership is old and sick. And um, you're not going to have that kind of cover and support for the Palestinians. On the Israeli side, they want peace with everybody. They don't just want peace with the Palestinians. They want peace with all the Arab states. This does not seem to be like the moment when a lot of Arab leaders are going to take that risk um, in Egypt. Uh, they have a peace treaty, but I mean supporting that kind of thing. Gulf Arabs worried about Iran. New governments in Libya and Tunisia, presumably in Syria one of these days. So I, I think the ability to get what is needed from the Arabs is greatly diminished by um, the Arab Spring. I think the departure of Fayyad is, is both real, really and symbolically terrible. Um, you know, Fayyad once said, um, Israel wasn't created in 1948. It was announced in 1948. It was created over a period of decades by Zionists. And this is not a quote, it's a paraphrase. And that's, this is what we've got to do here in Palestine. We've got to create a state. We've got to build the state. We've got to build it to the point where it seems normal and natural, and everyone will say, well, there it is. Let's go. He was the guy who not only could do that because he was an honest, an honest and effective civil servant, but because he could explain, what are we doing here? What is this project? Um, and he was against the culture of victimhood. We can't do anything because of the Israelis. And he would say, no, we will do everything despite the Israelis. Um, we will build and build and build. And so I think both kind of culturally, intellectually, I should say, um, and pragmatically, he was trying to do all of this. A lot of progress was made. A lot of progress was made. Uh, I think a lot of the progress is going to be unmade. Uh, this is my great fear. Uh, the amount of corruption came way down from the Arafat period after Arafat's death. I fear that the amount of corruption is now going to go way up with Fayyad Ghan. We spent, we the United States, have spent about five years now seriously engaged in building a Palestinian police force. You know, under Arafat, there were 13 security gangs that reported to him and, of course, fought each other. We built, we've now trained, we the United States, with some European help in Jordan, <clears throat> um, roughly 3,000 police. And Fayyad used to go to their graduation ceremony and say to them, what are you here for? You're not here to have a war with Israel. You're here to help build a Palestinian state, to provide justice and law and order. Um, I think that's going to begin to come undone. I have been told by people out there that already those police, already with Fayyad still formally prime minister, don't really report to him. They're really reporting now to President Abbas. And more and more, they seem to be acting as a kind of, this is an overstatement, but kind of Fatah hit squad. That's what you have to fear. And I do fear it. And, and uh, I worry a great deal about the erosion of such progress that has been made for the last few years. I hope Fayyad stays active in politics. 
and I hope he is able to persuade Palestinians to support what he was trying to do. It's not clear that he'll be able to do that. <clears throat> he was a great official. That doesn't make him a great politician. In the 2006 election, uh, he, his party got two or three seats, did very poorly. So whether he'll be able to have any kind of role in the future, I think, uh, unknowable. All right, you're all persuaded. It's clear. Uh, we, we have time for one more, if there is one more. All right. I was going to say class dismissed, but uh, uh, let me just thank Will again for the invitation and say I uh, appreciate coming down here. And uh, I actually do think if you're interested in the subject um, that you'll find a lot of interesting stories and accounts of what happened in that eight-year period in uh, Tested by Zion. So thank you. <laughs>